Hello, uh, this is Andres Karius from the University of Edinburgh. I'm a PhD student at the Center for Language Evolution, uh, supervised by Kenny Smith, Rich Applied and Simon Kirby. Uh, and I'll be talking about my recent PhD research. Uh, this is sort of a re-recording of a talk I gave at the CLE on Tuesday. Um, and I thought, since all conferences are cancelled now and the world is on fire, why not try something different like this? So I'll be talking about changing communicative needs and the structure of the lexicon and how these things are related. In short, I'll be talking about words, lots of words. Uh, the slides for this talk are online. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop me an email or just ask on Twitter. Right. So. All languages change over time. That's one universal thing about all natural living languages. Uh, there are many reasons why they do. Uh, one of them, for sure, is communicative need. Uh, or in other words, languages change because the speakers need them to change. Uh, speakers change their languages over time uh, so that they can remain efficient tools of communication. And this always affects all level, levels of language, but I'll be focusing on words and the semantic space. Uh, specifically, uh, two processes, which is lexical competition and co-lexification. And I'll be using corpus data supported by machine learning and also some uh, tentative experimental stuff. So, changing communicative need. Uh, I'll be using throughout this talk mostly um, a very simple model, which we call the topical advection model. Uh, we now have a paper out in Language Dynamics and Change, so check that out for details. Um, the idea is very simple, um, that changing topic frequencies in a diachronic corpus over time uh, approximately correspond to changes in communicative need. So basically, if people keep talking about some topic a lot, some topic of conversation, then you can reasonably assume that they really need to talk about this. this. It's important, right? So they have also probably a heightened communicative need to express uh, finer shades of meaning within that topic. Uh, more formally, uh, this is implemented in a really simple way. Um, for each target word, uh, and you'll see examples soon enough, uh, we create a topic consisting of some number of associated context words. Associate here means co-occurring, having a high uh, mutual information score, and then take the mean of the frequency changes in these words. So for example, latte co-occurs with these words and a lot more other words. So you can turn that into a matrix, see what words it co-occurs with, get the frequencies, convert them into mutual information, and this is a topic for latte, uh, cappuccino, ice sipper, and so on. And then see how much cappuccino, ice, and sipper, and so on, have changed between some time periods of interest. And this gives you an idea how you can compare how much uh, latte has changed in frequency. People talk more about latte, maybe, uh, but also how much people talk about the topic of latte and coffee. And and then we can use this model to, as a, a predictor for other things like competition dynamics. So what do we mean by competition? Here's, here's a little motivating example. Um, when you look at the corpus, uh, you get time series from a corpus. Uh, sometimes you see things like that. So you get uh, two words, which are very similar in that case, uh, airplane and aeroplane. And it seems that at first when Aeroplanes were, or airplanes were invented. Uh, people preferred aeroplane, but then airplane quickly took off and uh, pretty much killed off this word. Uh, on the other hand, you have examples like this one, where you have words with, again, similar meaning, like corporation and its short form corp, but also company, which is also quite similar. Um, and all of these in this time period, which is apparently the 1920s, uh, increased in frequency, but they did not kill each other off. So people kept using all these words uh, quite happily. So that I find that interesting. So 
on the one hand, you have cases where similar words, you know, people make a choice. And in other cases, you have similar words, but people keep using them. So the question here is, as some words experience higher selection, what happens to the synonyms, right? And the hypothesis is that frequency increase in a word will lead to direct competition, like airplane, and possibly replacement of near synonyms, unless the lexical subspace experiences high communicative need. So when people need to talk about something, like corporations in the 1920s apparently, then words with similar meanings are more likely to survive together. We can test that again using corpora. So for this, I gathered a large sample of words uh, from the historical uh, American English corpus. Uh, I picked um, words which have changed a great deal over short time spans, over decades. So there's a clear signal, uh, some word that was either did not exist or was low frequency has been suddenly used a lot. There's a clear signal to work with. Again, uh, using this sort of distribution approach. So again, the latte example is you, you get the co-occurring words, but now you can compare words like latte and decaf, for example, uh, by comparing the vectors. Uh, we're not using count vectors. Uh, it's slightly more complicated. There's an appendix uh, on the slides which has all the uh, technical details. But the idea is basically that compare vectors of co-occurrence to get similar meanings. And you can do that in a synchronic corpus to get synonyms for words, but you can also do it diachronically, uh, and then you get uh, words which were similar when uh, to the target word when this word word just came in into the language. An important bit of the competition model is this one. Um, in a diachronic in any corpus, really, um, all probably word probability sum up to one. So we, you normally see word frequencies. Um, and the sum of the one, which automatically means that if one frequency goes up, then another frequency must go down. Just that's how it works, right? Um, and then you can measure where this sort of probability mass comes from. So how far in terms of cosine distance, again, cosine distance between words, between vectors, um, how far do you have to go before you see your probability mass equalized. And that indicates if there's competition, so like airplane, uh, something very close by gets replaced, or there is no clear competition. Here's a more visual explanation of this. This is a semantic space of a language. Each dot here is a word, uh, and the color indicates uh, how much this word has changed between, let's say, two decades. Here we have an example of a word which has increased a lot, it's bright red. Zooming in, uh, you can see that that word has increased by uh, 10 units of per million frequency. Right? And then its nearest neighbors, which are these ones, have decreased, this one by eight and this one by two. Eight plus two is 10, so now probability mass is equalized. Uh, the increase in that word is sort of compensated by the decrease uh, in these two words. So that would be your airplane example. Uh, clear competition, uh, something increases a lot and kills off something else. But in other cases, you have words where this is not so clear and uh, the nearest words which have decreased are somewhere off in the semantic space, completely unrelated. Again, with the airplane example, Here's the same time series, uh, now just the uh, yearly frequencies. Uh, and on the right, it's the same thing, but binned into uh, decade length or 10 year spans. And you can see that the increase of airplane, which is this much, um, is compensated by the decrease in airplane. Not 100%, maybe like about the half, um, but you can go, you know, down in the list of nearest neighbors, which in the case of airplane were uh, also engine, machine, submarine, and so on. And then see which of, you know, how far do you have to go until this is 100%? How far do you, do you have to go to get this equalized? So this is one of the lists of words for each target, which this model relies on. 
And the other one is the uh, topic model. So the co-occurring words, which I started off with, have been of the talk. So the co-occurring words with airplane are apparently carrier, flyer, pilot, and so on. So these are the words that form the topic of airplane. And looking at the uh, frequency changes in these topic words, uh, you get an idea how much the topic of airplane changed between these two decades. And again, you can do that with lots of words. So here are the results. There's lots of stuff on this plot, so I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, on the vertical axis, you have the advection measure or the uh, topic change for each target. So here, airplane is quite low. It's, it's near zero, so topic change is almost neutral. But then on the other hand, on the other end, you have words which came in with a massive topic. So for example, radio, when this, this word became widely used, there was a whole topic about radio related things. And then on the horizontal axis, you have normalized distance where target uh, from target where probability mass is equalized. So again, for airplane, it's quite close to zero, meaning that only a few neighbors, uh, you only have to go a few neighbors deep in the list. Uh, here's one word, funding, which I think replaced the word appropriation uh, in the 1970s. Uh, so it's just one word that replaced almost another word. Uh, whereas again, these words on this end, like corp, for example, uh, it didn't replace any, any synonyms. And there's a correlation between that, which is exactly what we hypothesized. So if you have a neutral communicating need, then it's more likely you get competition. And if you have high communicating need, then it's more likely that similar words survive together. This effect is not massive, uh, but it's there. We also control for a large number of other lexical statistical variables, and, and this effect still persists. We also tried this out on a number of other corpora, uh, in that case, uh, German, Estonian, and also Scottish Twitter. I'm not going to talk much about these things because I want to talk about the other model. I'm just going to mention Scottish Twitter because it's frankly amazing. Um, I've been mining Scottish Twitter for about a year now. Uh, and yeah, it's it's quite wonderful, but I'll talk about it some other time. Because I want to talk about co-lexification. Again, I'll be using corpora, but later I'll be also talking about a co-lexification uh, experiment. Right, so the idea here is that semantic space density is not uniform. Some meanings are lexified by individual words, while others are co-lexified. So, for example, in English, you have the uh, hand and the arm, and yeah, this way around, right? Um, and it's you have two words for these. Whereas in many, 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 many other languages, you know, this part and this part, it's all the same. It's it's one word. People have, have studied this and they've noticed that uh, similar meanings are more likely to be co-lexified. So rather hand and arm, but not maybe um, hand and head or hand and houseplant, which makes sense. Uh, but also uh, people have noticed that uh, community needs may intervene such that strongly related ideas such as sister and brother, for example, may benefit from being distinguished with separate lexemes. And again, this makes sense. If you live in a society where it's relevant, where it's important to distinguish sister and brother, or father and mother, or, or anything like that, then it makes sense that you have uh, two separate words for these things. Although, in, in a way, you know, they're very similar. So this brings me to the next hypothesis. Changes in lexical density are not random. Some variance is explained by changes in communicated need. Again, we can test this uh, using diacrine corpora because this hypothesis is about change. So this is somewhat more complicated than the previous model. Okay, this is how it works. So for each word embedding for a specific period, uh, lay out all the words. Uh, 
ranked by their nearest neighbor, how far the nearest neighbor is. So on average, in this particular model, you have a nearest neighbor at about 0.7. Some words are very sparse uh, in very sparse spaces, so it's like 0.4. And then on this end, you have words which have very close nearest neighbors. And these are the ones I'm interested in, because in 95% of the cases, you only have one word on this side of the threshold, which happens to be 8 .8, uh, 0.85. On this side of the threshold, you have only one word at this proximity. Basically, you could say this word coalexifies this semantic space, this subspace. Um, but if you have more words per subspace, then there's something going on there. It's, it's more than you would expect. So uh, finer shades of meaning are lexified by individual words. This approach gives mostly reasonable results. Uh, obviously, I'm using a machine learning model here, which is not perfect. Um, it conflates uh, similarity relations other than synonymy. And also, I'm training these on 20-year uh, spans of Koha, which is about, I think, 20 million words per model, which for these sort of models is actually really small. Uh, usually, these models are trained on you know, like data sets like the entire Wikipedia, for example. But it still works. So you get most of these clusters you get are something like these ones. So either spelling variations, uh, close synonyms, um, or things that you know could reasonably refer to with one word. You do also get things that are not quite perfect. So uh, things that mo look more like antonyms, uh, not so similar things, and also uh, just the same idea, but different parts of speech. So I'm using 20 year spans here. Uh, there are two ways of analyzing change in, in density, and I'll be showing you uh, results from both approaches. So one way to do it is what I would call look back. So find a cluster and look into the past of that subspace, again, which you can do with diachronic embeddings. So basically see how many words were in that subspace uh, before in the, in the last 20 years span. The other approach is look ahead, again, find a cluster, and then see what happens in the future. So uh, does this cluster dissolve? Will there be just one word, or will this remain a stable, dense cluster? So just to visualize that, here's an example of a cluster, uh, truce, ceasefire, and armistice uh, after the Second World War. Again, makes sense. People needed to talk about these things. And here's the uh, relevant semantic space. So this is sort of a 3D plot in that uh, on the foreground in uh, black, you have the post-war period, the 20 years. And uh, in gray, in the background, you have the pre-war period. So truth, armistice, and ceasefire are in this part of the space. Uh, the nearest neighbors are to this cluster are disarmament and peace conference, for example. Uh, you can see that armistice and truce came from this part of the space, so there's a bit of a semantic change here, not a huge one because this is quite zoomed in. Uh, and then you have ceasefire, which is, when you look at the time series, is an actual new word. So there are two, two language change processes here happening. The result is that you have a subspace with uh, three very close words. Again, you can do that with a all the words, all clusters that, uh, of such kind that you find in the corpus. There's going to be a lot of stuff on this plot. I'm going to walk you through the uh, one of the panels first. So this is the look back model, uh, which means that this little cloud of points here, each point is a cluster, not a word, a cluster. Uh, at zero, it means that the uh, when you find a cluster, the look in this past, it was already the same size cluster in the last 20 year span, no change. And then one, two, three, that's you know increased by one, increased by two words. And again, on the vertical axis, you have advection, uh, the communicative need measure. So you can see that it's uh, also near zero for, word, for clusters which are stable, but it is slightly more positive 
uh, for clusters which have increased. So when you think back of the competition model, that's like a similar thing. When people uh, need to talk about some topic, then they are more likely to introduce uh, new words or at least let synonyms survive. And this, again, is not a huge uh, effect, but it's here. It's something going on here for sure. Uh, these are the rest of the results. So this is the look ahead version of the uh, uh, same model. So here there doesn't seem to much of an effect. But when you look at the bottom row, uh, this is, again, the look ahead model and the look back model, but only using these clusters where change uh, results from coining of new words. So here, the zero ones, zero change clusters. Uh, these are the ones that just stay stable, same number of words. Uh, whereas the ones that are positive in that case, or negative change here, are the ones where either respectively new words came in, or uh, in the look ahead model, where you had a big cluster, but then some words just went out of usage. And both of these seem to have a slightly bigger effect. So there is something there. Uh, Communicative need seems to predict some variance both in competition and collectification in clusters. Um, but corpora are messy, messy population aggregates. So I'd be interested in how does this actually work on the level of the individual? How do people actually deal with that sort of situations? And for that, we can use experiments. Now, this is very much work in progress. Um, it was going to be a lab experiment, but then the apocalypse happened. So now we're going to have to do that online. Uh, the next hypothesis, given limited lexical resources, uh, speakers are more likely to co-lexify similar meanings as found in previous literature, unless blocked by increased need to distinguish the similar meanings. And we can sort of simulate communicative need in an experiment quite easily. So this is an artificial language coordination game. Uh, it's played in diets. Uh, it's quite similar to what James Winters and colleagues did in 2015. Uh, the signal space consists of seven artificial words, and the meaning space consists of 10 meanings, which are just English language nouns. So you only have seven words, but 10 meanings. So to effectively communicate, you will have to assign one word to multiple meanings. So in that, in the previous arm and hand example, since you now can only work with a limited number of words, you'll probably want to have a single word for arm and hand, or arm that way around, yes. Um, obviously, my native language is such that arm and hand are indeed one word, which confuses me endlessly in English. Anyway, so the English nouns, which stand for the meanings, come from the Simlex 999 uh, Human Similarity Judgments dataset, which is mostly used in machine learning, but we can make, make use of that. Obviously, we control for formal similarity uh, between words, uh, and also we check the free association scores. So we want to focus on words that people consider synonyms, uh, not just freely associated things. For the artificial language, uh, these are just uh, words made out of CVE syllables. Again, we control for the similarity of form, uh, and also we make sure that none of the artificial words are anything like English words. So they all look weird, basically. Uh, this is how the game looks like. It's a very simple interface. So uh, they take turns uh, sending messages to two participants playing, playing the game. Uh, the sender uh, sees this sort of screen. Uh, they're presented with two meanings, in that case, fashion and area. And they need to communicate fashion, in that case, uh, this is randomized, uh, using one of these uh, artificial words. There is no training, they're just thrown in the water here, and they have to figure out a communication system that works. Uh, and we're also keeping a tally of the score, so if they do badly, they'll hopefully feel bad. Uh, they take turns, so the uh, other person in that case would be seeing uh, also these two meanings. And then the message, so let's say the first player sends Wozo to say fashion, and then the other person has to guess. And through this guesswork, they will hopefully figure out uh, a reasonable correspondence system between meanings and words. 
the trick here is uh, that each meaning set has three pairs of meanings which are very very much similar so for example rain and drizzle in the baseline condition uh, they have shown a uniform distribution of pairs uh, and the expectation here is that they will co-lexify similar things like hand and arm or drizzle and rain because it just you know, makes sense and there's people what have what people have found in previous literature in the target condition uh, this is where it gets interesting uh, is that um, we modify the distribution of pairs that they are presented with such that the similar meaning pairs such as rain and drizzle are actually more frequent much more frequent than others and now it would be hard it, it would be difficult for them to communicate if they collectified this because they get presented rain and drizzle all the time so if they have just one word for it they cannot quite communicate right so it would be more useful to have separate words for rain and drizzle and then collectify some other pair um, in the set that they're given and here this is what we would expect the similar pairs are no longer collectified Again, this is work in progress, so I'll just show you two pilot runs. Uh, here's the baseline condition. And the uh, English language meanings are on this uh, vertical axis, and the artificial words are on the horizontal axis. And the cells here, the numbers in the cells, uh, show how much, how many times uh, this meaning, for example, journey, was lexified by this artificial word. In that case, Rue. Here you see something that's very much expected. Uh, they collectify similar meanings like trip and journey, area and, jo so area and zone, and also belly and abdomen. There's a bit of a balancing problem here, which we have now fixed. Um, but yeah, this looks good. Target condition, uh, communicative accuracy is still quite high. So both of the, those pa uh, pairs of players did quite well. Uh, and here you see there's a bit of a difference. So people are still really eager to co-lexify uh, pair and couple. But with journey and trip, they seem to have figured out that, okay, this, this journey and trip keep popping up together. So it's useful maybe to have two different words for these meanings. And this is a plot comparing the results. So baseline on the left, target on the right. And there seems to be a slight difference. Uh, between these things. Obviously, there's a problem here uh, in the targeting condition to communicate effectively and not co-lexify the, the high frequency pairs. Uh, they will have to co-lexify something else, which means that something like manager and Bible or rat and um, bias, which are obviously a bit weird things to co-lexify. So we expect the effect is not going to be huge but hopefully it's going to be there. We'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll be running about uh, 80 participants uh, very soon. Wrapping this up, communicate you need, um, as operationalized uh, by the uh, advection model, uh, does describe a small amount of variance in competitive interactions between words in a diachronic corpus in multiple languages. And also, it seems to describe some variants in co-lexification dynamics. So that was the second model. Maybe this effect is bigger. That's what I think. Uh, I am, after all, using very messy uh, samples, and corpora are very messy samples. Um, over, you know, they're quite sparse over long periods of time. Um, but it's the best we got, really. Uh, the models are based on machine learning, which is you know, just crunching numbers. Uh, similarity comes from co-occurrence. It's not perfect, um, but it's a way to, to sort of dive into this big data and, and get at least something out of it. So the next or, or pretty much ongoing step is now try to see how these processes might work on the level of the individual using the experiment. Uh, the experiment actually has a little online uh, stimuli generator, which I uh, made so feel free to play around with that. It, it generates funny artificial languages. Uh, slides are online. Uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for listening.